Mike Simmons, welcome to the Modern Sales Management Show. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, Josh. Now, Mike is one of my podcast heroes, my sales po podcast heroes. He hosts the uh, Sales Catalyst podcast, and he's been doing it for four or five years. And I strongly recommend that everybody listening to this say, check that out. And I will include a link in the show notes to the Sales Catalyst podcast. How's the podcast going, Mike? Awesome. And just a quick correction. It's Catalyst Sale Podcast. So when you look for Catalyst Sale Podcast, you'll see it, you'll see it out there. And it happens all the time. Um, the uh, Things are going great. We just pushed live episode 203. And, uh, and for the most part, we've done it on a weekly basis. And um, yeah, really, really excited about people that we've had on there, content, feedback, all kinds of stuff. So it's uh, things are going well. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So Let's, let's talk about you and how, how did you first get involved in sales management? Give us a little bit of your history and how did you get to the point where you are seen as an expert in this area? Yeah, I don't know if I'm an expert. Um, so maybe someday somebody will see me as an expert. We'll get, we'll get there at some point. But um, I, um, I stumbled into sales. I never wanted to get into sales. And then I started working in a uh, uh, today they call it customer success role, um, implementation success inside organizations, and then started getting familiar working with salespeople and then started getting groomed to move into a sales role. Um, and uh, just an awesome opportunity with a mentor who wanted to see me move into an account executive role. Fast forward a number of years after that, number of individual contributor roles I brought got in my first team first team was account managers and then when I left uh, the kind of the w2 space I uh, was responsible for a team of 45 folks uh, in a sales organization so pretty exciting stuff and um, but yeah it just it's I'd always been interested in the on the lead in the leadership side of things didn't know that I was really interested in sales but I've always been focused in helping others solve problems and found out that that's kind of what sales is and also realized I can make a, a decent uh, living doing it. So uh, one thing led to another and people liked working with me. I liked working with people and, and you know, here, here we are. And you're, you're one of the go-to people for me when I have a, a sales leadership, sales management, sales strategy question. Now, you describe sales as a thinking process. What, yes. what do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, so many people get into this idea of um, there's a do this, don't do that kind of mode or mindset to sales. They think that things are really prescriptive. And um, I can tell you that I, I've never come across someone who can sell in the same manner that I sell, nor have I ever come across someone who sells in the same manner of somebody else. Yet we create these scripts and these processes that try to uh, shoehorn people into a certain mold. When I talk about sales as a thinking process, it's that what we want to do is give people tools, process, frameworks to help them sell like themselves. And in order to sell like themselves, they've got to apply thought. So we've got to ask questions. We've got to listen. We've got to iterate based on what customers are, are sharing with us. And that's why I say sales is a thinking process. It's not just a uh, read from a script and all of a sudden magic happens kind of thing. Does that idea of sales being a thinking process resonate with people or do you get pushback from the community? I know you're really active on LinkedIn, especially. Yeah. The, the biggest negative of the tagline is that uh, one, people don't care to think and two, uh, there are not a lot of people that are really fans of process. Uh, so I definitely get a lot of pushback where it's, you know, some people will say, no, it's more of a doing process. Yeah, you've got to do the work. You have to do the work. Um, what I've found is the people who are most successful at it apply thought. They actually sit there. They, they ask questions. They listen. They ask questions that build on those things. So, yes, I get pushed back from the market, and it isn't for everybody, but um, I will. This is one of those hills that I'll die on. It is a thinking process. If we could, if we could think better about the way that we interact with our customers, we could, and with our team, the way that we manage our team, we lead our teams, we could do so much more than if we get into trying to manage everything through spreadsheets. And I think we're seeing a lot of that as more people are now having to work with remote sales teams and not able to manage by walking around and tapping people on the shoulder or see what they're doing. They're they're realizing. 
wow, I can't do this through a spreadsheet. I have to engage with folks. The feedback I'm going to get is a little bit different. Uh, so yeah, sales is a thinking process. I'd also say leadership. Most things are, you know, should require some level of thinking. Uh, that's great. I mean, the, the thinking makes smarter doing. And yes. So what makes a great sales leader today? I think the biggest thing for me is listening, like having the ability to listen to what's going on. And, and it's important to, to reinforce this um, kind of with a visual. You know, we're on video. Josh, you've got two eye, or you've got one mouth, you've got two ears. We have two eyes too, but you've got one mouth and two ears. Uh, if you're doing a lot of the talking in front of your team, you're not necessarily leading. You might be managing something. You might be conveying information. Leverage those ears in the same way you want your sales team to use their ears when they're interacting with customers. Ask good questions, sit back and listen. And when you listen, take that bit of feedback, take that information, start to identify patterns that exist among the team or among the customer base, and then start testing within that team, within that customer base. Is that so the thing I would highlight is key listening. Listening. So is that a natural position for a lot of sales leaders, or is that something that they need to work? They need to work on their listening skills. It sounds like preschool, but you know, you know I think I th so that one of the challenges is, especially let's talk about early sales leaders because this, yeah, I've been, I was there as an early sales leader, and as I put my, it wasn't that I was much shorter when I was a sales leader. I my stopped growing. I think my junior year in high school, but the um, when I first started. I was this hard charging dude that was really good at my job. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to have a lot of people who are going to do things the same way I do. So I was trying to say, I'm an individual contributor. I'm going to turn a bunch of other individual contributors and the same kind of individual contributor that, that I was. And all of a sudden magic's going to happen. It doesn't work. They're not no. you. They don't have the same experience. They don't have the same mindset. They don't have, they, there are so many different things that they bring to the equation that if you try to, turn them into you, you're going to be, you're going to be in trouble. And as high performing sales reps who move into leadership roles, and usually that's what happens. You perform really well and you're like, okay, well, now it's your time to lead the team. We miss on the coaching aspect, which is helping people do things, providing some guidance, not actually doing it for them. We miss on the idea of how can I amplify capabilities among the team? Um, so I do not think it's common for new sales, lead, new sales leaders to be good leaders because I don't think they've had the leadership experience and the practice or the training to help support that. And if you're in one of those positions where you're trying to create a bunch of people who do the things the same way you do, you're, you're on the path to failure. You'll learn pretty quick. You'll realize you can't. And then you'll find some people who really do some other interesting things well, and then you'll start amplifying the team. I would, I would ask you to start there first. And one of the best ways to learn that as a, as a high performing individual contributor is to go out and coach kids sports. If you coach kids sports, you could start to see how important it is to bring kids together and have, help them be successful. You can't go out there and compete on that field. You start competing through others and then you realize, wait, I can apply a lot of these concepts and lessons into the workplace. And that would be my guidance to that early career leader who's moving from individual contributor into a sales leadership role, find some time to volunteer and, and, uh, and work in youth sports. I love that advice. I haven't heard that before. So let's talk about um, mid-career or experienced revenue executives or sales leaders. What are the biggest challenges that they're facing today? Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge that they face is that they think they can apply the playbook that they used at another organization. Because most of the time when they move into that role, it's because they've left another organization and now they're moving into a new organization. They look at this and they say, I can take my playbook from here and I can apply it over there. I'm a Jets fan. Um, if we apply the Jets defensive playbook to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, we might be in a bit of trouble. Now, granted, Todd Bowles, I think is down there coaching with Bruce Arian. So he has a background in the Jets. That might be a little bit too much detail. So there might be a little bit of overlap. But the, if you try to apply your playbook from Oracle into an organization like HubSpot or into an early stage organization, you're, set, you're setting yourself up for, for 
figure, you may not understand the mechanics that were used to build out the playbook. And now you're being asked to implement it inside an organization where your players are completely different. The market is completely different. So mid-career, as you take that step up from first leadership to next level leadership in an organization, if you do it outside of the company, just be careful about trying to bring that playbook over and, and plug it in. Is that a hiring trap that a lot of companies get into? Hey, this person ran a team at IBM. They're going to do great at my organization. Yeah, I mean, there's an old saying, nobody got fired for hiring IBM. So, and then, But I know a lot of sales leaders who've left IBM to join early organizations and you see that they don't make it much longer than six or 12 months. And um, you know, some of them are just trying to get that experience, which is good. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you look at it and say, I'm going to take somebody who has this background and I'm going to be able to plug them into my organization. They're going to be able to do it. Uh, you're, you're, you're opening yourself up for a lot of risk. And one of the questions you can ask is, so when you built this system or when you built this playbook out, what were the, what was the thought process that went into it? And sometimes they, they might be able to answer it if they were around and other times they, they may not. And other times they might be full of crap with their response. So I'd ask that kind of a question. The other question I would ask is, when you're in, you know, what can you give me an idea of what the makeup of your team was? What kind of resources did you have? How did you interact with other members of the organization? And we see it, you know, as you and I interact with folks, there's sales and marketing. Sometimes there's not a great alignment product and sales and marketing. Sometimes there's not a great alignment product, sales, marketing operations. Sometimes there's not a great amount of alignment product, sales, marketing operations, finance. Sometimes there's not great alignment. If I come into an organization that's a little earlier stage where there's not that same amount of alignment and I expect to have a number of these resources to be available, I might set myself up for failure because I'm not going to be able to lean on marketing inside the new organization in the same way that I was able to lean on marketing inside the old organization. So if the key isn't bringing somebody over from an, another company who's had success in that company's selling system and market and product set, how do you, what, what is your framework for building a, a playbook? at an organization. Yeah, I, so it's, just, to, just to be clear, some of those people might work really well. They just have to have the right mindset. They've got to understand the mechanics of how these things work. And for people who are watching the video, there's a lot of stuff on this whiteboard. I mean, I've got pie charts to talk about distribution of revenue and I've got frameworks to talk about sales process related stuff and call planning and all that other kind of junk. That's I'm not a weird, evil scientist. I just like, putting stuff up on a, on a whiteboard. I think it's understanding these kind of things. Um, understanding how, at first, how does a customer go through the process of making a decision? How do they go from, I have no idea I have a problem to, I have a problem to, wow, I want to fix the problem to, hey, there's some solutions that are out there to, wow, I think I can actually see this working to, I want to implement to, yes, this is the best thing in the world. I, it's the most amazing thing and I want to tell everybody about it. That's kind of that customer decision making and buyer journey type stuff. And you want to know what happens inside our organization? How do we execute? Um, and then you want to know from a rep perspective, how do your reps execute on an predictable, in a predictable manner, you know, day by day, what's that engagement look like? What are the tools? So you take these broader frameworks, ideas and concepts that, and you'll notice all of these have empty spaces. They have empty spaces because the words change depending on the organization you're working in. And you go through the process of saying, this is how I can start applying this here. And sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. So that's where the testing and iteration process comes into play where you've got to retool and you've got to say, okay, this is going to take like the old, uh, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? This one's going to take us six licks to get to the center. This one's going to take 20. This one's going to take three. How do I design based on that? And that is, if you can go in with those concepts, you know how people make decisions, you know what engagement looks like. If you can go in with that mindset, you can start to draw out what an ideal playbook looks like. Now that makes a lot of sense. One of the things that you uh, talk about a lot and that I look to you for is uh, advice on goal setting, not only on the individual level, but the, the sales organization level. How do you approach goal setting across an entire sales organization and then bring it down to the level of the individual sales reps? Yeah, I mean, goal setting within a, within a sales organization is pretty easy. I mean, it's just, it's numbers. Like, right, we've got a revenue number that we're, that we're attacking and we're either hitting it or we're not. I mean, we've got these quotas 
And you know, sometimes you look to the left or the right and people who were there two months ago aren't there anymore because they didn't make quota. And it's, although those decisions are tough to make and it's tough to lose people, it's pretty binary when you start to see the numbers and where the performance is. Um, so that's, the, that's kind of the functional component. Um, whether or not those goals are the right goals for the organization, I think that's to be determined by an organization. Some of those are driven by outside uh, functions. Some of them uh, the organization has a little bit more control over. As a leader inside that organization, make sure you do not sign up your team for an unrealistic goal. It's your responsibility to be able to not only understand what the goal is, but see a clear path that will help you get to that goal. Beyond that type of goal, that revenue goal, um, and it actually applies there too, but it's you, you take the number and you say, okay, in order to get to this number, here are the three things I need to do in order to hit that number. And then beyond those three things, here are the measurables for each one of those things that I need to do to help make sure that I'm on track or hold myself accountable. And if we go through this process, and I talk about it in the goal setting and execution framework stuff, um, and there's a blog post on it, and I'm sure you know, Josh will include it in the, in the show notes. But the, there's a, as we build out this framework, what we wanna do is we wanna say, um, there are things that we do that are measurable, that if we do those well and can hold ourselves accountable to those things, it will improve our ability to complete activities, tasks. If we complete those tasks or those activities, that will improve our ability to execute on the goal. And the mistake that most people make is they'll set a goal, but they won't put the structure in place to help attain that goal. Smaller bits that help attain the goal. What so, are some examples of the smaller bits? Go ahead. So, yeah, okay. So let's say that I need to bring on, let's say I need to bring on three customers in the next 90 days. Okay. So I need to bring on three customers in the next 90 days. There's going to be three general activities that I can do to bring on those customers. I can conduct outreach, direct outreach to uh, customers, uh, prospects that fit my ideal customer profile. I can go to people inside my network and ask for uh, referrals. I can increase the advertising that I do from a marketing perspective. Those might be three things that I could do. Within each of those, the outreach to prospects, it might be I'm going to send out three communications each day for a five-day period to 15 different people. Um, so now I've got the 15 different people, the three communications over a five day period. And I use that as a measurement to help hold myself accountable. So that would be kind of an example of working backward along one track. I've got the outreach to the people, the time cadence or the number of communications, the time period aligned to the people that I'm trying to get connected with and then ultimately get that goal of bringing in three new, three new customers in that period. The math might be off a little bit, but that would be an example of building up toward that goal. I like that. It's, it's almost simple. It's extremely simple and regimented and the simple is what you can do. I mean, like, uh, you know what they say, uh, there's an old, um, there's an old special ops saying that they say, um, you know, slow, is smooth, smooth is fast. I would just re repeat that and say, simple is smooth, smooth is fast. And if you can just go through or iterate on it, if you can create really simple things, like I've got squares and hexagons and circles, if you can go through simple things, you can improve your execution significantly. You don't, um, you don't solve complex problems with complex solutions. You solve complex problems with simple solutions and then just execute on that. If you can create simple things, it'll improve execution significantly. That's, yes. we're going to have t-shirts made. Um, Perfect. So, I mean, that, that takes me, you know, simplicity breeds clarity. And so talk to me about why this clarity is important and what do people get wrong about being clear and having clarity in the, the sales process? Yeah, so like this image that I've got up here at the top, this is, this is a territory planning image. It's in our logo. Like if you look at the Catalyst Sale logo, you'll see that in there. Each of those lines are lines of clarity. That circle up at the top is an area of focus. That's where I focus my attention. That's my ideal customer. And it's my idea, I've got two of them. There's an the ideal customer for an organization level and there's an ideal customer at uh, an individual level, so a role level. The lines of clarity are declarative statements that describe who that customer is. 
a company that's generating over two million in annual recurring revenue. They're in the enablement tech space. They have a technical founder. Uh, they have more than 20 employees inside their organization. Those are things that I can search for in the, a tool like Navigator and filter out companies that are that meet that profile. Maybe I want to add in another one that they're growing at a rate of 20% or, gr or greater, whatever it is. But those lines of clarity, declarative statements, yes, no statements, help me move through that area chart so that I'm no longer trying to boil the ocean or boil the entire market. I'm extremely focused. So clarity and focus help with execution. And uh, that's the, that's the uh, I think that's the title of the blog post. I think we, we've done it. So uh, this, Mike, has been a great conversation around sales management. Where cool. can listeners find you online? The best place to find me is uh, go to catalystsell.com. That's, you'll be able to link to everywhere. That Our Twitter profile is on there. The blog is on there. Podcast is on there. Catalystsell.com. If you want to connect with me directly, the most the place where I'm most active is Twitter, and my Twitter handle is Simmons underscore M. Great. Very well. Thank you, Mike Simmons. Do you have any final sales leadership advice for our listeners? Yeah. Uh, nobody knows how to do this stuff. Uh, so if anybody is telling you, this is how you do it, here's your playbook for success, you just listen to this for plus or minus 25 minutes, um, you know what? There's so many opinions about what you can do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Ultimately, if you just go out there and start doing the work, you will figure out what works for you. Avoid your biases, do the work, test, and you will figure out your process. Don't come be beholden to somebody else's just because they say this works. You know, it might work because they just had perfect product market fit inside uh, ideal at the right time, right place. They were selling N95 face masks uh, on March 12th of 2020. And yep, you know what, for whatever reason, their business took off. Um, it wasn't because they were really good at sales or because they had designed some awesome product market fit. The market just happened to fit them right at the same time. So just, just be careful about who you trust. I think that that's a great way to end this. So that has been another episode of the Modern Sales Management Show. Thank you, everybody, for listening.